Um, yes, yeah, so good afternoon. Um, I'm Jenny. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and I apologize for my lack of Spanish. I think gracias is about as far as it goes. So gracias for inviting me to beautiful Madrid. Um, I'm a museologist. Um, I currently live in Berlin, where we moved uh, about four and a half years ago from Scotland. Um, and I run the... Oops. <laughs> the... Um, non-profit initiative, Museum 140, um, and this is sort of our motto, is we strive to bring together museums and museum lovers worldwide through fun and engaging social media projects. Um, museum 140 launched five years ago, March 2011, um, when I was on maternity leave with my first son and I was missing my work because for museums for me have never been just a job, they've always been a passion. So I was feeling a bit out of it. Um, I'd used Twitter um, for a couple of years before that, but um, not as much. And suddenly Twitter became, for me, a lifeline to museums sitting at home with a, a baby. Um, and then after a while I thought, why not make this into something a little bit bigger? And that's how Museum 140 was born. Um, so I was asked to share some of the projects that we've run over the past five years and hopefully give you um, some inspiration to, to, and some ideas to run your own projects. And I'll also be sharing some of the lessons we've learned so that you can avoid making the same mistakes. So I've, I've already made the mistakes for you, you don't need to make them again. Um, and what I've done is, I'm not gonna go through them chronologically, I've sort of grouped them by types of projects um, because that made more sense. Um, so it all started on Twitter which is also where the name comes from, Museum 140, the one 140 character limit on Twitter. So the first few projects that we ran were all, I always say we because I have some helpers in the background, my husband who's a technological wizard and he does all the, the, the website and stuff. Um, and on some of the projects we partnered up with other museums and other people, that's why I always say we. Um, yeah, so our first project was a Twitter project, it was Museum Memories Day. It ran in May 2011, and the idea was that people were invited to share their most, me most memorable museum moments. So, um, like their, their first visit to a museum, their, their favorite, their, uh, yeah, anything that was memorable to them. Some things were memorable uh, because, I don't know, a guard shouted at them. That's memorable for some people. Uh, most of the memories that were shared were um, things that had really positive and lasting uh, impact on people. Um, so, yeah, over, over 1,300 people took part, 1,300 individual Twitters. We had over 3,000 tweets and it trended in 12 countries. So that wasn't bad for a first project, a first try at doing something. Um, and I think I have, yes, these are um, just from the first year, just a couple of my favorite quotes, uh, favorite tweets, just to give you an idea of the, the breadth and the different types of things that were shared. Um, the following year, we did something else um, um, around that time of year. So I actually started in, in May 2011 because uh, International Museums Day's theme that year was about memory as well. So that's where the idea came from. So in the following year, they had a different theme. We did something different and everyone said, where's Museum Memories Day? We want to do it again. It's May, why is it not happening? So in 2013, we brought it back and we've been running it every May since then and actually this year, it's taking place in a couple of weeks' time on the 12th of May, if anyone wants to take part. Um, and the hashtag, as you can see highlighted here, was Muzmem. Um, it was a little bit obscure. We did think about just having museum memories as the hashtag, but it's quite long. We wanted to leave as much space as possible for people to actually tweet their memories, because they only had 140 characters. So we went with Muzmem in the end, and it kind of caught on. Um, even though it was a little bit obscure. But um, that's something to watch out for that when you're selecting your hashtags, that they make sense to people so that people remember them um, and don't end up using the wrong hashtag. Um, something else that has changed over the years is in the first year, I'd say about 90% of tweets were in English. Um, and as we've repeated it year after year, more and more people have started tweeting in their own languages. So I think last year we had 
six, seven, eight different languages. And what we'd done um, in the first couple of years is I'd actually sat down and analyzed the contents of the tweets to see like, what were the most common words being shared. Um, and as more and more people tweeted in different languages, that just wasn't possible anymore because to have to translate them all first to do some kind of analysis. So we just stopped doing that. That's a really good example of how the project evolved and how we adapted to it. So, um, yeah, a lesson we learned from that was, you know, just because it worked one way the first time doesn't mean it has to rigidly be repeated that way in the following years. So it's okay to change it a little. Um, People are just happy that we do it every year. So, um, And what we've actually done last year and are doing this year, we've taken that on board, and now we're actively communicating and actively encouraging people to tweet in their own languages. Um, so we've just made that part of the, the current incarnation of, of museum memories. Um, so yeah, we did lots of other similar projects, that what I call Twitter projects. So you have a theme and a day and a hashtag, and. It's sort of all over by the next day, but we had Museum Spark, Museum Bloggers, Insta Museum, Museum Pins, um, but I'm not going to go into all of those because um, they, they kind of all followed the same pattern. So what I wanted to do was move on to photography projects because for me those are the most exciting, maybe because I'm a keen photographer myself, um, but they're also exciting because they're very visual. People like something visual. Um, this was the first um, one that we did. Um, it was called Museum Exposure, <laughs> which was a bit of an obscure name, and that was part of the problem of why um, it was more of a qualitative than a quantitative project. Um, so we only had just over 200 people that joined in. Um, but those that did join in, you know, they, they had a good experience. So what it was, it was on the 11th of the 11th of the 11th, uh, 11th of November 2011, we wanted to do something to m for this special day. So the idea was that we asked people on that day to take photographs in museums, so they had to be taken on that day, and they were only allowed to share 11 photographs each. And because of that, the platform that we chose was Flickr, because it, in Flickr, you I don't know how many people are familiar with Flickr. It's kind of not as popular anymore. Um, you can set up a group that people share their pictures to, and you can set a limit. So we were able to set the limit no more than 11 photos, whereas if you use something like Instagram, you know, people can share however much they want. You can't, can't really control it. Um, so over 200, just over 200 people joined in. We had about 470 photos that were shared. But if you do the maths, 212 times 11, we should have had over 2,000 photos, uh, so of four or five times more, if everybody had actually shared 11 pictures. So um, the engagement wasn't as big as we had maybe hoped. And we looked at it and, like, to say, I don't want to say what had gone wrong, but what could we have done better? Um, and one problem was the name. We seem exposure. We thought we were being really clever. Exposure. Um, in English, you use exposure when you're talking about photography, you're, you expose a picture, but also the museums were exposing themselves, and yes, it was too clever. People didn't really get it, it wasn't very memorable, uh, <laughs> and there are also too many other barriers. So, first of all, Flickr was kind of not the number one uh, platform for photos anymore. Um, you had to not only be a member of Flickr, you also had to then join the, f the Museum Exposure Flickr group, you had to take your photos on that day, so you weren't allowed to use old photos. And then you had to you know, think carefully, which 11 photos am I going to share? So too many barriers. Um, so the next project, we decided to make it much easier for people to take part. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> yes. So um, the next photography project that we ran, which was actually two years later, so we took a little break from photography projects, it was in September uh, 2013 during Social Media Week, Museum ABC. Um, and the idea was that we asked people or encouraged people to share photographs of museum objects, architecture, what's A is for architecture, so, um, relating to the alphabet. We ran it from, for a whole week, Monday to Friday, and each day we highlighted a few letters. So on Monday we had A is for architecture, you know, B is for boat, C is for your curator. You get the idea. Um, and we had, this time, we had, um, yeah, we had almost 500 images that were shared. Um, and what we then did 
was we pinned them onto Pinterest. So people were sharing them uh, mostly on Twitter, also on Instagram and Flickr, um, but Twitter being the main channel for sharing them. And then we, uh, so they didn't actually have to engage with Pinterest themselves. We just then took the pictures from the various channels and pinned them and we had um, 26 boards, one for each letter of the English alphabet. Um, and nine museums got really involved. They did the whole alphabet from A to Z. It was really fun to watch them like, as the week went on. They were getting really into it. And afterwards, they gave us some feedback saying and they'd never had as, as much fun in like, months at work. So that was really nice to hear. Um, there were two things that we learned from this project. One was, um, again, having to um, be a bit flexible and adapt it a little because a to Z, 26 letters is the English alphabet. Now, that's the way I set it up because um, you know, I speak English. Um, that's, and that's the language that we communicate with in uh, mostly in Museum 140, sometimes also in German because I'm actually originally from Germany and live there now. Um, but we had quite a few museums from Scandinavia taking part. So then we had the Danish and the Swedish museum saying, well, hang on, we've got other letters in our alphabet. When do we get to share those? Um, so we said, oh, just share them now. We'll make some new boards for you. Um, so that's what we did. Um, we sort of hadn't anticipated that, but that was no problem. But it's a really um, good example of how we just sort of adapted things as we went along. And also makes us think for the next time we do something language related, knowing that we have an international audience, maybe thinking it through a bit more. <laughs> that, um, are there any, um, I don't want to say hitches, but any, uh, any special things that we need to watch out for? Um, and the other thing that we learned from this, I mentioned that people were sharing on Twitter, on Instagram, on Flickr. We were also using Pinterest to collect everything. There were too many platforms. It wasn't so much a problem from the point of view of the, um, the people taking part, um, but more from a managing the project point of view, because I was having to monitor four different platforms, and that was just too many. <laughs> so again, next time, simplify a bit more. Um, that was fun. I don't know why I keep doing this wrong. So um, and the most recent photography project that we ran, which is actually in March, so just a couple of months ago, and my favorite one today, always every time we do a new one, I say this is my favorite one to date, um, was Museum Rainbow. And again, um, this time we didn't have letters, this time we had colors. And this ran for a whole week this time, not just a working week, so Monday to Sunday. And um, again, we were asking people um, and museums. So we, in all of our projects, we always have individuals and museums um, taking part, which obviously also have an individual person managing the social media accounts, but they take part as their museum. So we were encouraging them to share pictures from museums relating to the colors. And again, we had focused one on each day. So Monday was red, Tuesday was orange, and so on. You get the idea of them. We joined up violet and indigo, and we had a sort of purple kind of day on Saturday. <laughs> because um, as we were approaching Saturday, people were saying, what exactly is the difference? What's between violet and indigo? And we realized there were a lot of different perceptions in color. So again, we said, well, let's just have you know, an all-encompassing purple day on Saturday. And then on the Sunday, it was dedicated to actual rainbows themselves, so um, objects with rainbows on them. And um, it was a um, very colorful project um, based on um, actually here. And again, we, I sort of started collecting the pictures on Pinterest. This is sort of a cross section of the seven Pinterest board. We also had one for rainbows, which kind of didn't quite make it onto the, this is a collage. Um, I kind of had the previous projects in mind, which had sort of again, sort of quality rather than quantity in terms of engagement. So I myself have picked out sort of, you know, a dozen pictures for each color to make sure we had at least some uh, for each of the boards. Um, and I foolishly said I will pin them all to Pinterest because I, again, Museum ABC, just under 500, that's doable. And then on the first day, on the Monday, we had over 200 images shared just for the color red. <laughs> Um, and I thought, mm, okay, this is going to be challenging. I wish I hadn't promised to pin them all. Um, then a couple of other things happened. My baby fell ill, so I was suddenly managing the project with one hand on my phone while sort of looking after him with the other hand. Um, and then Pinterest blocked me, something that I didn't know. If you pin too many images in 
too short a space of time from the same source, they will block you. Um, it's automatic, so it doesn't matter if you go to them and say, I'm not a spammer, can you unblock me? You get blocked for 24 hours. So by the time I was unblocked, we were, we'd already moved on to yellow, and I was still pinning red pictures. So I said, OK, adapt, <laughs> be flexible. We kind of changed the message that we were sending out and said, um, we will pin a selection of images for each color <laughs> um, to create some beautiful rainbow boards on Pinterest. And then what I've been doing is just since then, just to keep everything for the record, I've been adding, you know, have a free evening, I'll sit down and pin some more. But yes, that was another good example of um, just things that happen. That some things are just out of your control. Um, I'm not sure how I could have had a contingency plan for that. Um, but the other thing I learned, like, be careful what you promise or what you say you'll commit to. And also just you know, have a little more faith. So I was thinking, well, you know, in the past, um, we've never had that many people um, in comparison to really big projects that happen on Twitter. And then, of course, this time, it just kind of exploded on me. Um, so in total, there were um, 600 images shared on Instagram and about twice as many on Twitter with some crossover. So about a thousand, just over a thousand individual images in total. Um, and lots more people joined in to actually help spread the rainbow, as I like to call it. So we had over 8,000 tweets that were sent with the hashtag Museum Rainbow. About 80% of those were retweets, and the other 20% were the, the images being shared. So it made quite an impact. I had people sort of sending me comments and messages saying, oh, my Twitter feed is full of color this week. My Twitter feed is awash with, with a rainbow. Um, and one person said, oh, Museum Rainbow is hands down the best thing on Twitter all week, which, of course, <laughs> considering the rough start um, of the week that I'd had, that was really nice to hear. Um, but again, there's something that we learned from this, and that was um, set up your analytics properly. So um, for the previous projects, I always used free tools to record analytics, sort of, you know, how many people, where from, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I hadn't expected this project to um, take off in such a large scale, um, and I hadn't reviewed the tools I normally use since the last time. And some of these tools change. You might use um, some of these tools um, and know, you know that at some point they'll start charging. And then you either can't use them anymore at all, or if you're using it for free, you only have a certain limit. So they'll only record like the first 1,500 tweets. And we had 8,000. Um, so um, what happens to the other ones? Um, so that was a bit unfortunate. Um, luckily. I mentioned earlier on, my husband is a technological wizard. So um, he was able to retrieve some of the data and some of the statistics for me without the use of um, these online tools. But obviously, not everyone is that lucky. Um, so what I would say, the lesson learned is, yeah, set them up properly in advance. Like, just take into account it might turn out bigger than you expect. Um, so don't necessarily rely on the free tools if they have really if they're really limiting. Um, and also, if, if they're tools you've used before, do check and that they haven't changed since the last time, or that the, like the, the usage terms haven't changed. So that was um, the photography projects, or our favorite ones I've done. Oops. Um, so the last sort of type of projects that um, we've been running are our long-term projects. Um, now, these are stickers from a project called Adopt a Museum that um, people who took part got, got a sticker <laughs> for taking part. Um, so Adopt a Museum was actually the second thing that we ever did after Museum Memories Day. It launched in July 2011. Um, and it's basically a blog, and each entry is about a different museum, and as we like to call them, an, an unsung hero of the museum world that we want to shine the spotlight on. So you might be familiar with these uh, lists that sort of circulate in the news and on social media, like 10 most popular museums in the world, the 10 best museums, the 10 most visited. And it's always the same museums that get a name check. Um, and there's so many small, fantastic museums that fall under the radar, the hidden gems from the title slide, as, um, as I like to call them. So we wanted to shine a spotlight on them. So for this project, anybody who wanted could take part, and they had to pick one museum that they really love that wasn't one of the big popular ones. And they got five short questions to answer, um, and uh, one photo, so it was really easy. Um, and then, so you can go to the blog, um, 
if you go to home, it will show you the, the most recent entry, and it, it reads just like a blog um, on post for a museum. And then we also, we've also plotted them all on the map, so you can also go and, and click your way around. Um, and um, yes. I thought I had an example of one. Oh, yes. <laughs> We've got one from Madrid here. Sorry, I should have maybe warned Oscar that he was going to feature. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to go and visit this in the next couple of days because it comes highly recommended on Adopt a Museum. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so, yeah, the only rule we had is not allowed to be a big famous museum. So, the plus points of this project is quite easy to take part. I mean, the questions weren't very long. Um, you didn't have to join a platform. You didn't have to be a member of anything. You just had to send me your, your answers to the five questions and one photo. Um, and in some cases, people didn't have a photo. And then I sourced photos through you know, other people like um, on, uh, on other like, photo sites. You can you know, check, has anyone shared a picture of this museum? Then email them, can we use your picture for this nonprofit project? And I think we've only got one, like, see it on the side there on the right, <laughs> which doesn't have a preview picture. There's one entry that we couldn't get a photo of, but all the other ones have at least one photo. But um, the downside of it is, or we found that it's, so this was set up to just run as a long term project. Um, our aim was to feature at least 100 museums. It's been running for five years and we've reached 67. So you can see that doesn't quite commute, uh, compute. Um, when we started it, we had, there was big enthusiasm, lots of people wanting to take part. Um, if everybody who had uh, contacted us and said, I want to adopt a museum, had actually returned their questionnaires, we probably have about 200 museums on there at the moment. Um, so at the beginning, we had enough to post one a week. And then we sort of went to one a month. And I think the last one we had was almost a year ago. So we've now got to decide, do we actually say, actually, it's no longer a long-term project. We're going to archive it. Um, or do we revive it and actually try and reach the, those 100 museums? Um, so it's just, yeah, as we've, we've found, unfortunately, keeping a long-term project running isn't always easy just to keep that enthusiasm and that momentum going. Um, and the other long-term project that we have um, is the Museum of Museum Souvenirs, which is basically intended to be um, an online crowdsourced collection of museum souvenirs that people have, that they've bought, that they've brought back. Um, don't worry, I don't have a photo this time, Oscar, but Oscar also took part in this one. So, uh, <laughs> we've got very, uh, overall, actually, we've got a very good Spanish um, participation, I meant to say, for, um, I've got it here, for Adopt a Museum. So the most museums feature from England and the USA with 14 each, but in joint second place are Germany and Spain with seven museums each on Adopt a Museum. And the Spanish museums are also quite active in the um, Museum ABC. So, um, yeah, <laughs> just wanted to add that. So, um, yeah, museum souvenirs. So the idea is, again, um, collecting photographs this time of museum souvenirs. And again, it was, we thought it was very easy. You just send us a photo of your object. You tell us what museum it's from, if you can remember when you got it, although that's sort of optional, um, and your name. And if you want to say something else about it, one or two sentences, you can. If not, that's OK, too. We thought this was really, really easy, but because it's an actual website with, um, I should have another picture here. There we go. This is a, so you can see I took this just after I'd added lots of tote bags. Um, but uh, we needed the we need the photographs. Do need although it's a very simple idea. The photographs they need to be in a specific format. They need to be a minimum size and ideally against a plain background. But what was happening, so people would see this mentioned on Twitter, they'd go, oh, look, I have this uh, museum pen on my desk. And they'd go, right, snap, tweet. I was like, mm, OK, well, it's, it's too small. It's square. And it's got all your other stuff in the background. I'm, um, <laughs> so this was proving a lot more difficult. We thought we'd made it really easy, but people wanted it even easier. They just wanted to snap and tweet. Um, so we need to have another look at how we might re review or revise that and actually I'm not really sure you should admit to this, but um, of the 104 entries, we've got 104 objects in the museum, and of those, 13 were submitted by other people, and the rest are all mine, <laughs> because I actually collect museum souvenirs, which is where the idea came from. Um, so again, I've got to decide, do I just continue running this as my personal project now, or do we relaunch it in summer you know, when everyone's coming back from holiday and just, again, simplify how people can take part and see if we can get some, more, uh, some other people sending in their, um, 
uh, their um, souvenirs. And actually, out of the <laughs> out of the people that did take part, we did get a haul. There were sort of four or five pictures submitted of museum badges. You know, like you get badges in lots of museums um, because there was a, a museum badge day or something like that. I think it was hashtag museum badges where people were sharing pictures specifically of museum badges. So I kind of piggybacked onto that. I was sort of following it and when people sharing badges saying, oh, don't you want, wouldn't you like to share that to the Museum of Museum Souvenirs as well? So that, that was another way to get some more people. Um, so how are we doing? Um, yeah, that was the, our projects that we've been doing. Um, just before summing up the, the lessons learned, I just quickly, just for complete, completeness sake, just wanted to mention two other things we do because you get to the point, we've done lots of online projects and we thought, what's the next step for us? So we actually did a couple of offline projects um, where we then had the offline and the online audience. Um, and one is that our series of Muse Ups that's been running in Berlin for a couple of years. They're basically museum tweet ups. We just called them Muse Ups and that's what we call them in Berlin. Everyone in Berlin now knows what it is. Um, and with that we found, um, again, the initial enthusiasm was really big and then it sort of started to get less and less and fewer people signed up. So then we um, experimented with different formats. So we had one uh, where we did a walkabout around the city to places relating to uh, uh, the museum in question. We had one where we did a pop-up exhibit at um, the Museum of Prints and Drawings and the curator had made a selection in advance um, that we photographed and people, uh, the people that had signed up and people that were going to follow it online were allowed to vote. So if she picked 20, I don't know if it was 20, but she, she picked a number of um, um, artworks, more than she would, could go through on the actual night, and then people could vote. And I think then the, the eight most popular ones were the actual exhibition that she m created a little mini exhibition in the library um, for the tweet up. So we just experimented a bit with that. Um, and the, the last thing, the last project I wanted to mention was the Museum Marathon that we did in Berlin in 2014, um, which is a sponsored walk, raising money for charity. I don't know if the idea of the concept of sponsored walk is well known in Spain. We discovered it was basically unknown in Germany. <laughs> um, the idea actually came from London where it had happened a year before and they raised over a thousand pounds for um, um, a British charity, because everybody knows what a sponsored walk is. Everybody knows someone doing one. Everybody constantly gets asked to contribute. Um, and Germany people say, what's a sponsored walk? Why, you, you want me to give you money just to walk around Berlin? <laughs> Why would I do that? Um, so we had a lot of sort of um, uh, educating people about what a sponsored walk is. Um, and we didn't quite reach our target. We raised about two thirds of what they raised in London. Um, and most of that came through my friends and family who had sponsored me because they knew what a sponsored walk was. There were a couple of other people. Some had come over from, flown over from the UK to join in. And it was basically all the people with British connections who um, were the ones being sponsored and the other ones just came along for a nice walk around Berlin. So um, <laughs> it was, um, we visited 26 museums in, in a day, it was over nine hours and covered 15 kilometers. Um, so that was the walk part of it. Um, and um, the other thing that we found, we made it free because we thought in lots of people, you know, more people are more likely to turn up. But what we've now learned is, is if you charge a small nominal fee, as you call it, even if it's just three euros or five euros, people are more likely to turn up because they feel more committed because they've paid for it. So actually, about half of the people just didn't turn up, which was a shame because we had a really big waiting list. Um, and we had just a, a maximum number of people that could come because we were actually going into all these um, 26 museums. So, just to finish, I wanted to sum up the lessons that we learned. Most of these I already mentioned as I went through the projects, but I just wanted to sum them up for you at the end. So, yes, choose your hashtag carefully. Um, make sure it's not too long, not too obscure, it's memorable. The same goes for your project name. Don't, don't think up something that's too clever. Um, and also, yeah, check it's not already being used. Um, we've never actually had that problem, because we always check, but... Um, I can't remember what it was. It was something I was attending a while ago and I looked up the hashtag and then something completely different popped up. I was like, mm, you didn't check before choosing this, did you? <laughs> so, um, yes, reassess your projects before repeating them. 
um, review, reassess, change if necessary. So just because something worked once doesn't mean it will continue to work in the same way every time. So like with, with museum memories, we stopped doing the content analysis. Um, that was the, the one of the examples for that. Um, choose the right platform. So for, muse for the museum exposure, Flickr is just the wrong platform. Um, and um, we haven't really used it since then. Sorry, Flickr. Um, and um, the other point was, yeah, don't, don't choose too many platforms because it's difficult to monitor. Um, really, really important, minimize your barriers to participation. So for museum exposure, we had an obscure name, an unpopular platform, and too many instructions. So that's why it didn't work so well. And for museum souvenirs, we thought we'd made the barriers pretty low. Um, but we hadn't taken people's behavior into account. So they just want sort of instant participation, instant gratification. They don't want to go and set up their photo. Um, um, and then on the other hand, so museum memories and adopt a museum. Um, so um, ignoring the fact that adopt a museum has been difficult to maintain over time, that actually taking part is really easy. So that worked well. And museum memories, because it's, it's just because it's really easy to join in. So that it's kind of logical, I mean, it's, uh, uh, the easier you make it for people to join in, the more likely they are to join in. It's just um, sort of not really rocket science. Um, and then for Museum Rainbows, what made it work really well was that we allowed people to share old pictures. So they didn't have to be new pictures that they just photographed specifically for Museum Rainbow. They could use old archival photos. Some people did um, photograph a new, new thing. Uh, take new photographs, but you didn't have to, so that made it easier. And we did have some rules um, and or some structure. Like I said, we were highlighting one color each day, but I wasn't actually being very strict. So because there's always people who see the hashtag and they jump on board and they haven't actually read the blog post about it and the, you know, the, the two rules that you're meant to stick to. Um, so on, on the first day, we had people sharing you know, blue and yellow and whatever, any, anything but red. And I was just like, yeah, it's fine. I was just happy people were taking part at all. Um, and then other people who were taking part, they would jump in and say, whoa, today's green, why are you sharing purple? And so I didn't even have to do anything. They were just sort of regulating themselves, which was quite fun um, to see. Um, yeah, set up your analytics, set them up in advance, aim high, expect lots of participation. So my new motto is now, it's better to be disappointed. So if in the end fewer people take part, um, it's better to, better to be disappointed than to be unprepared. This is my new motto um, going forward in, in terms of analytics. And yeah, check the limits on free tools and whether they've changed since you last used them. Um, balance the needs of online and offline audiences. I didn't actually go into depth on that, but that sort of came out of the tweet ups where we had, uh, for some of the tweet ups, we actually had more people online following than offline taking part. And we just we discovered it's not easy because they have different needs and to please them all. So, And we were doing them bilingually as well, where we could, because our online followers, for t uh, two thirds of our online followers are English, um, but always, you know, over half of the people taking part in Berlin were German speaking. So we tried to do them bilingual. And then, you know, what do you do? Do you, do you tweet about everything in two languages at the same time? Do you start at opposite ends? And then people are tweeting about different things. So we didn't really um, find the sort of golden solution. Um, I think the advice is just to experiment a little bit and um, see what works for your audience. Um, and just um, um, an example from actually from my work, when I worked for National Museums Berlin, we always tweeted in German 99% of the time. So if someone asked us the question in English, we'd answer in English, but it was always in German. But when we took part in Ask a Curator, I don't know who's familiar with that. It's just a big Q&A session on Twitter, in, usually in September, um, with cur where you can ask curators um, in the world, museums around the world questions. So we took part in that twice. And because that was an international thing, we took part in English, even though usually we uh, we tweeted in German. So for us, that was an, an important lesson that uh, yeah, to, to be flexible and with the audiences, uh, to, to meet the needs of your audiences, depending what your project is, what you're taking part in. Then yes, be adaptable. That's probably one of the most important things we've learned. You know, don't be rigid. Be adaptable. Don't be afraid to change things. Um, and finally, it's okay to have fun. 
Um, I know this varies from museum to museum and country to country, um, but um, it's okay to have fun. Not everything has to be like uber educational. I'm not saying it shouldn't be educational at all, but um, I don't know, you know some, sometimes it's difficult convincing superiors to take part in something that's more fun than educational. Um, and um, an example of that, again, from my work, actually, not from Museum 140, was um, when I was doing the Twitter for them, we'd always tweet, you know, happy Museum Monday, have a good week, everyone, and the same at the weekend, have a good weekend. And we always had lots of engagement. And so my boss said, well, if that's the thing people are responding to the most, why do we even bother? This is just, you know, sort of... Uh, just for small talk, um, and I said to her, well, it's really impo the reason it's important is because it's the small talk that builds your audience, that binds your audience, so then when you actually have something important to say, not that saying good morning isn't important, but you know what I mean, when you then have something important to say, then your audience is there. But, um, so I think eventually, she, uh, I managed to convince her why it was important to do those little social fun things as well as the other things, um, which, just lets me finish on the thing I always finish on, which is don't forget the social in social media. Um, yes, and have a little bit of fun. I think that was it. Pizza, pizza. Ni alguna pregunta en la sala. La verdad es que nos ha dado una buena lección de de formas de trabajar en las redes. ¿Tenéis alguna pregunta que hacerle a Silvia? Oh, yeah, also, these are my contact details if you want to contact me after. Hi, Jenny. Thanks yeah. for the presentation. I was unaware of all these projects and I'm <laughs> going to follow on May 12th, I think. That's the date? Um, yes. Okay, I, so... Moving away from my contact details for a second, I made a save the date for you all at the end. Okay. I want everyone to share at least one museum memory. You don't have to work in a museum, you only have to visit it once. So it's no excuses for not taking part. No, not that day, just whenever. So a lot of the people who are sharing childhood memories is actually pro probably the most, in, in terms of types of memories, or the, the biggest type of memory. But yeah, sorry, your question. Oh, it's okay. Oh. Uh, I was just interested in, uh, when you were talking about the uh, Alphabet project, and you had nine museums participate most fun that they ever have in the, that time. How do you engage with the museums? Do you contact them previously of the event or are they just spontaneous join in? Um, it's a bit of both actually. I mean, um, when we started out, I did, um, um, it was through Twitter, but I would, tw some museums that I had contacts to, I either tweeted at them directly because then um, also they're, you know, they can just retweet it, it's really easy for them. <laughs> um, whereas if I send them an email, they're less likely to then put it on their Twitter um, and ask them, you know, will you join in? But so now as our audience, is, we've got over six and a half thousand followers now on Museum 140. Um, and a lot of them, probably about half of them are museums. Um, but yeah, so w when, when we were doing um, our very first projects, I, d I contacted museums directly and said, hey, we're starting this, I'm starting this new initiative. Wait, will you take part and will you let all your other museum, you know, friends um, and followers know about it? And then it kind of snowballed from that. And now usually, because um, we've got so many followers now, it kind of snowballs by itself. But um, initially, it was we, we gave it a little bit of a helping hand. <laughs> A uh, quick question. Um, do you get any kind of financing for this, or can you generate any sort of revenue? No, this is, um, I just do it for the love of museums. If I could find a way to um, actually make this my day job, I would love to do that. No, it's all, um, yeah, the, 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 the costs that do come out of it, which aren't huge, I mean, it's like the web hosting and, and things like that, and occasionally we've had competitions where we've sent out little prizes, as I pay that with my pocket. I file it under, well, hobby isn't quite right, but you know, yeah. I, I just pay for it myself at the moment. It's, the costs aren't huge, but if I can find a way to make Museum 140 my, my day job, then that would be fantastic. <laughs> Bueno, si os, si os parece no que tenéis alguna pregunta más rápida, si no pasamos a la siguiente parte. Gracias Jenny, thank you very much. Oops, sorry.